All right. Thanks. And welcome back to the Compound Growth Marketing Show. I have Chip House on the call today. I'm excited to dive into some topics related to the customer buyer's journey, CRM, and how to get the right data to the right places at the right time. Chip has been a veteran in the industry. He was a member of that exact target marketing team that went over to Salesforce with that acquisition, spent time at 451, Sharp Spring, and now a CMO at Insightly. So Chip, pretty impressive career. Hey, John, thanks for having me on. Super excited to be here. And it's been a journey. You have the benefit of time and wisdom when you get to this point in your career. But I've been in SaaS really for 25 years, but out of college, I started in catalog marketing, which was a great base because I worked for Fingerhut Corporation, which at the peak of the 80s was one of the largest catalog marketers around, yeah. highly data-driven company. So I learned a lot of the stuff that set me up well for the kind of the analytical career that digital marketing is today. Um, but my first SaaS job was as the first marketer at Digital River, an e-commerce company, which is now like a billion dollars. And because we were scaling fast, I was able to try a lot of cool stuff in the late 90s, early 2000s and learn a ton just by trial and error on email marketing and banner advertising and e-commerce website optimization, all sorts of things. And I was able to take those like you talked about to exact target to help that scale that company for 13 years until we were acquired. Wow. Awesome. I'm excited to jump into it. And let's see. So tell me a little bit more about Digital River. Yeah, I joined in 97. Like I said, I think when I was added to the team, I was the first marketing person. We had a sales team going after independent software developers, and we had an engineering team, obviously building the e-commerce platform. And so it was before electronic software distribution was a thing. Yeah. You, you only bought software on CDs at best or via direct mail or something like that. And so it was a great idea at the time. And I basically started out just helping our software customers optimize their website for purchase. And then it helped because I had the catalog marketing background and some e-commerce background when I was at Fingerhut, but just what do you measure to help software companies optimize their marketing? So the, all those experiences brought you to Insightly today, where you're now the CMO. And I think being in the CRM industry at this point in time is an incredibly exciting place to be. Tell me a little bit about what made you want to make that move from Sharp Spring to Insightly. Yeah, the, obviously the years at Exact Target was I was steeped in email marketing and steeped in essentially marketing technology. I made some moves there back to B2B e-commerce and in the HR space with the startup, but I wanted to get back to a growing scaling company in marketing technology. And so I joined SharpSpring. We did great. We were acquired by Constant Contact. So now that's part of a Constant Contact. So I went looking for a similar type of company and was really compelled by the culture, the growth, the product, and the white space that Insightly fills in the market as a modern, affordable CRM. So. Yeah. Awesome. And then related, but I, you've been CMO at a couple of different companies. You've yeah. come in, you were talking to me earlier offline about how companies need to look at the full funnel economics, understand the best ways to drive efficient growth. What has your approach been when you're coming into companies? How are you thinking about building out, understanding the most efficient channels and the most efficient ways to grow? Yeah, and I've heard you talk about this too, John, but certainly this is a process that developed over time for me. And analytics, like I mentioned before, are super critical in a catalog marketing company because you're printing something and mailing it. So there's a cost for every incremental thing you do. And so you're automatically thinking about who should I mail, right? Who is least likely to return my product or go bad debt on me for me to send them a catalog. And so if you take that modern that mindset into modern marketing. And you have to think very similarly, especially in 2023, how do you drive efficient growth? And so I think the first muscle a, mar a marketing person needs to gotta be curious, right? It, this is not about 
hey, I'm just going to write some messaging and send some things and count M MQLs and feel great about myself at the end of the day. I need to think about everything we're doing and what really happens to that duel when it comes in the door. Because depending on your sales cycle in enterprise B2B could be a year or two, right? And right. so the MQL that you create today, you don't really even know if it turns into revenue for two years. But And so you have to go back two years to, to look at how are you generating leads back then and figure out what works and what doesn't. But for most companies, their life cycles less than that, or sorry, their sales cycles less than that. For us, it's about 90 days on average, which is nice because a lot of the new buyers or potential buyers that come in and fill our pipe this quarter will close in quarter or they'll close next quarter, right? But with that said, you still have to monitor both real-time in-month data in addition to cohort data. And if people are not familiar with cohorts, it's basically tracking everything that happens with your spend as it pr progresses down funnel. It's super, super, super important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And how many funnels do you all have? Like how many different calls to action on the site do you have? Typically when I'm looking at a funnel economics exercise, I see two different ways to look at it. One is by channel. The other is by the different funnel. And I define funnel as like trial, demo request. Some people do eBooks. There's chat on the website. But how many funnels are you looking at on, on your site? Yeah. First, let me hit the channels because that's probably yeah. in the, the main place of focus for us. Uh, and the zeitgeist for B2B marketing right now, it feels like everybody's coming to the same realization is I can't just build my business by spending more money on it, right? There's diminishing returns. Right. And some of what makes you feel great as a marketer gen generating MQLs is not going to turn into real business. And so you have to break that down. And be curious, and I take out your microscope and look channel by channel. We're tracking, of course, what attribution software will help us with, but also M's campaign by campaign, direct and organic, AdWords, paid social, HQLs, events, referrals, other pay-per-click and review sites, ABM slash intent channels. And so we look at each of those separately, and it confirms everybody's suspicion that what looks good at top of funnel doesn't always look good at right. the bottom of the funnel. I mean, I heard you talking about this before, John, just call out content syndication, for example. That's right. a classic example. And the reason is the potential buyer is not at all bought into your brand. You have no brand affinity with them. And frankly, in a space like mine, it's definitely excited to be in CRM, by the way, but there's a lot of noise, a lot of competition in CRM too, right? And if somebody is in market, they are also talking to some of the well-known companies in the space. And you just have to assume that. And so how do you differentiate? How can you move faster? How can you truly create a differentiated affinity with your brand that's going to get people to ultimately raise their hand? Because those channels are going to close at 25% when somebody sort of bought into your, to your brand and what you're talking about versus interrupting them, getting a download, and then certainly they might even convert to an opportunity, but they're talking to six other competitors, right? And so the chance right. that they pick you is heavily reduced. And Yeah. Yeah. We just see such a difference in the funnel, depending on how people enter it, how they get to our site, the point in the buyer's journey that they're finding us. We see differences in velocity down the funnel, the conversion rates, and even the average deal size. And that, that as you mentioned, that's even true from the opportunity stage to closed one. It can be a huge difference. Yeah, no, no question. And do a better job of answering your question about the site. I guess we want we're on a couple of main funnels on the site. And it matters to us the size of company, right? So generally, somebody it, it's helpful when somebody comes to our site obviously engages with us. We'd love if they raise their hand and request a demo. And if they're the right size company, they can talk to sales. And sales is typically does a better job of educating them on the platform and um, you know how they can get value out of it, demonstrating yeah. some social proof, how similar customers in their industry have solved problems with our platform, et cetera. So yeah. I generally, a demo request 
is great for us, but a trial works great too. And it just might be a little bit earlier in the funnel, maybe, but maybe it's not. There's more and more buyers don't want to fill out a form, don't want to talk right. to sales. They just want to go experience the product themselves. And so then you have to think about that funnel very differently and how you're talking to that person that's choosing to try your product and what are the what's the marketing messaging, what's the sales messaging in that trial period that's going to convince them that yours is the solution they should go with. Yeah, yeah. And I find it's interesting because there's different contexts that people can be coming into on the trial versus the demo, right? There's the do-it-yourself person who doesn't really want to talk to a sales team. I always think of it Lassian for that one because they were targeting engineers, highly technical folks, and those, uh -huh. like their whole audience just does not want to talk to sales, what I've seen. But then there's this other cohort, and I call it like the second wave which is customers who were previously at another company using Insightly and they moved to a new company and they want to bring Insightly with them. They already know how they want to set the CRM up and they can be setting up trials as well. How do you get intelligence from, like, I think the things that a lot of PLG companies struggle with is really getting to know the customer. Because the sales team can be the ears for the organization in terms of hearing why somebody is looking to move on to your CRM, in terms of understanding what's going on in that company, in terms of handling the objections. So in the PLG motion, what are some of the things you look at to understand what the customer is going through and get a better understanding of them? First, I, let me just build on your last point, because we in the past year, we also added the how did you hear about us field and just left it open, we learned a ton from that. We, we know that now that 20% of our business comes from referrals and word of mouth, right? We didn't really know yeah. that before. That wouldn't show up in your any other attribution metrics necessarily. And seven to 10% comes from former users now moving to other companies. And what historically, we haven't done anything to really promote that necessarily. Yeah. It's just people liking their experience and taking it to another company. And so we've learned a ton just by asking for that feedback on the on forms and things like that. I think the rest of the intelligence also comes from asking, right? We have a customer marketing effort and we have done office hours. We do surveys in concert with our, our CS team. And we also run a rewards program where we ask people, hey, if you're happy and satisfied with Insightly, do you want to tell your story? Do you want to refer other? How do you want to participate with us? We just, I think you have to be proactive as a marker to, again, to just ask your customers yeah. and talk to them. How do you use pro our product? How do you get value from it? And then be able to connect the dots yourself. Yeah. All right. Let, uh, so I want to dig in a little bit to the data in the CRM because- yeah. I, I want to like connect this discussion with the full funnel discussion, but how do you think about the data in the CRM in terms of the feedback it can provide marketing and how you can be setting sales up for success? Yeah. And this is an important topic for us. And we drink our own champagne, <laughs> but, yeah. right? So we run on our own CRM, our own marketing and services app. But uh, yeah, this goes back to, I think, running an efficient marketing and rev ops organization, right? Is it starts with curiosity and thinking ahead about what am I gonna need to know to run my business efficiently, right? And so you're moving beyond just who's the company, firmographic data and simple person personalization to better understanding the multiple buyer roles inside of a company, their industries, and how those align to maybe feature adoption or integrations that they're right. going to want and the specific pain that they have. It's it's how do you take your CRM data and make it useful as a marketer, right? By thinking about it in that way, but also how do orgs connect to contacts? So I was talking to Jen Allen last week and she talked about the number. I don't know where she got this data, but 11.2 people now are involved in yeah. a buying decision well, inside of yeah. an organization. And so yeah. I guarantee you, most sales reps are maintaining two or three people, right? right. Are they maintaining 11? Are they even thinking that way? And marketers have to help and work closely with RevOps and the sales team to broaden how you think about the influencers inside of an organization. And so all that kind of sets you up for success ahead of time, but also whether it's existing business, 
or new business, you need the data. When a salesperson loses a deal, they're like moving on to the next one, typically, right. re rather than focused on why did I lose this and documenting that data very efficiently for the marketing team and the sales team, right? And certainly some percentage of people's might, or people or deals might be ghosting you, right? Over time, right. because they're not interested for X, Y, or Z. So there's not data to put in to the CRM. But I tell you, hey, if you're a salesperson, or please put the data in. And if you're a marketing person, look at the data, because there's a ton of data there that will help you be better as a marketer for why am I winning? Why am I losing? What competitors are coming up? Or what internal challenges are they having? It might be just spend or economy slowing down the deal, or it could be, hey, in, in the last several deals, we haven't been able to influence the IT buyer. Why is that? Is it they don't like our API or I'm not saying this is an example of ours, by right. the way, or, but it's, it could be that type of thing. And you have to personalize that. And the data is important. Yeah, there are going to be shifts as you add different features. So I can imagine with your CRM, there's a integration with this with the ERP that you make, and that makes it a lot easier for a certain cohort of buyers, let's say wholesale or something like that, who have a vertical integration with or have a vertical focused ERP in their space or different software like that. Understanding why you lost could mean, okay, Here's a batch of customers we can now go back to once we add XYZ to the product. So partially it's, I think you got to make, you got to show why there's something in it for the sales reps. And that yeah. can be really difficult these days to do that. Yeah, I think so too. Because it, granted, I think you have to have an enablement team and a strong rev ops team to make that possible because they can show the data back to the sales reps as part of enablement. And hey, here's the learnings from the data that's been entered in. Here's what we're lacking. And here's why we're better because of it. So use this learning in your next sales call. But uh, yeah, no, I think the marketing sales relationship is often fraught. And I think there is, this is one of the things that tends to get in the crowd of marketers is just like right. the CRM not being updated. And uh, frankly, I think we have to do a better job of helping sales understand why it's important. Right. Yeah. And because going back to driving efficient growth and looking at the full funnel, you can have a cohort of customers that are, let's say, cheap, for lack of a better word, to acquire, right? And those leads may look good at the lead level. They may fit their criteria to become an MQL because they ask for a demo. They're of a certain size. It's a certain title within the organization, but it may struggle and die in the pipeline stage. Uh, and if you don't understand why it's getting closed one, until you do this kind of overall analysis to look at how are specific industries closing down the funnel, you may find that it's just not, it may take you too long to figure out you're going after the wrong customers without feedback from the sales team. And I've been yeah. in conversations where it's like, I always found it useful to go into on a weekly basis, the pipeline, look at specific leads we had a handshake agreement with our sales team about what the qualification was for leads that we were passing to the sales team, but they'd hold it in, they'd hold it in. They wouldn't tell us why they weren't reaching out to a specific lead. And we'd be like, why aren't you reaching out to this? And they're like, because when we talk realtors, they always have their own African tracking system that they use that's specific to their industry. So they come in, they look at us, but then they find out about this one and we end up losing the deal at the last minute. And, and so it can be really valuable in making the sales team more efficient if they're passing that information in. It can also help you with future like win back type campaigns. Yeah, it's a hundred percent. I went to, we have a number of solar companies that use our platform because they can manage the entirety of the journey from marketing and selling. And then they convert deals to projects and then right. they manage the install at the consumer's house or whatever. And I want to go more in into case. this in a second, but yeah. But the re so I went to the RE Plus show, a solar industry show, and got deep in the brains of everybody in that industry. And I learned a ton about what they think about the other systems and software that are used in, in that space. And that's sort of that's sort of firsthand, super, super valuable information as a CMO. 
as we start building our next solar industry campaign. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we just make assumptions as to why we're not winning something, but with better data from the people that are talking to the customer or go listen to the gong calls yourself and get the right. data. Yeah. So I love that you brought that up because I think one of the really unique and cool things about Insightly is you have the CRM, which is the base. That was what the company was built on. You have the marketing solution and you have the customer success solution all under one roof. Yeah. And most of my career was spent in the software industry. So we had, and usually we were selling, like when I was in-house, usually we were selling like to Deer. I always make the reference to the article, 100 Ways to Build, or Five Ways to Build a $100 Million Business. So Deer are $10,000. You're selling like a $10,000 ACV product. Sure. Yeah, we had, a, we had rabbits, deers, and elephant. Or yes. Rabbits, deer, and elephant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. he added two more. Great article if you're listening. I It's provided a fantastic framework for me to think about marketing. But so the onboarding process was pretty quick. And then when I moved into an agency, or as I started my firm, I've started to hear things in the conversation that are maybe not important at the very beginning of the consult, but could be big opportunities down the road for clients or, but I think that what I love about you guys bringing everything under one roof and if, and I think you even provide some like project management slash onboarding tools is you create, you connect all the customer data across the funnel. So your CRM is not just about getting the right data understanding the marketing and sales process, it might be a company that you, your, the sales teams who use Insightly may be manufacturing companies who are selling multiple times to like a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or a, a John Deere type company, but having all of that full funnel customer data in there. So once the clients close, the the customer success team or the account management team has a ton of intelligence to be able to continue selling to this customer is, is really important. Yeah, I, that's part of what we think as being modern about the platform it right. is I was acquired and as an exec target, we were acquired by a cloud company, right? right. And it was fine back then it, it as everybody was doing technology rollups for have it to be just part of the cloud. But that doesn't mean it's part of the same database, the same data right. set, the single view. In fact, often it's not. And making it, you need a whole nother platform to pull them together. Right. To database is set up in a different way. And so like the communicate, the way the data moves from one platform to another is not going to be contextually relevant. Yeah. And so that context is super, super important. And the unified platform and aligning teams is an important benefit for us. But what I've learned as a marketer too is... People don't go searching for a unified platform, right? They're compelled by the individual use cases and capabilities of a CRM and a marketing automation and customer service. And then they're more compelled after, if they're interested in those in the concept of aligning the journey for the customer. But it's understanding that how the buyer gets there that's important for us. Exactly. So understanding during the initial deal process who the competitors were in the deal, understanding if it's a, if you're selling to a company over and over again, understanding why in the past you've lost deals, selling into that company, understanding everybody in the organization, those 11.2 people, who should we be talking to and keeping track of who the economic buyer has been in those situations becomes even more important for all the different people, all the different organizations, sales to account management, to marketing, to be able to be more efficient. But it's still tough to get sales to care about that. Yeah, I mean, that's why I like saying you, you have to have, you have to have some tenacity and some curiosity and the willingness to, to challenge the kind of the status quo if you're gonna make any headway as a marketer these days. Yeah, I agree. I think I often think of product marketers when I think about that, like the curiosity, getting on the calls, listening to the gong calls, understanding what's happening. But demand generation needs to be right there as well to understand why are the leads that, why is sale, like all these leads fit the criteria that sales is talking about? Why are they getting pissed off? That, or why are they getting annoyed that these leads are coming into the funnel? 
But it, it, it might be data that you can't see if you're not measuring it. But we measure speed to lead. Like how quickly are we actually engaging with somebody once they come in? And Jay Bear, I don't know if you've seen his research, is pretty compelling about people, a majority of people are more likely to even pick the more expensive brand if they're faster, right? Yeah. Because we're all impatient now, right? And we expect right. speed, we expect instant gratification. And so not only do you have to be good, you have to be fast these days. You get that advantage too of being the first one to set the tone of, hey, here are the things that your products, if you're buying, this is what you need. And so you get to if you're the first person talking with that prospect, you get to shape the whole buying process for them in terms of what the really critical features are for them. That's a super good point, right? You you can sort of verbally build out the RFP that they should care about that sort of, you know, leads with what you're good at. Yeah, you know? it's like the, how we used to see a ton of those buying guides of here's what you need to be paying attention to if you're buying a marketing automation system or applicant tracking system, but the sales team, it's a different level of engagement with the customer when the sales team is having that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. No question. All right. I missed. I don't know. I feel like we could talk for a long time, John. Yes. And that's why I know that you're going to come join us on our show. <laughs> yeah. Closing time. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you in the hot seat and ask you more questions because I do definitely have some questions, you know, about this. And a lot of people are trying to save money on paid and take a more of a demand generation, demand creation approach. And so I have questions about the chasm of uncertainty or the drought of despair or what I, the dip of despair yeah. as you make that journey. And it'd be fun to talk about. Awesome. But thanks again for having me. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, guys.